Hi, I'm Jimmy. In this video, we're looking at what we can do with cash today since interest rates are so very, very low. Perhaps this cash is something where we have to decide that we're waiting for a good investment on, or maybe it's an emergency fund, or maybe it's just sitting in a savings account. Either way, what can we do with our cash today to ideally get our money to start working for us? And since we all want our money to work harder for us, I thought it would make sense to put together some of the best choices in today's low interest rate environment for what we could do with cash. Okay, so let's jump right in. So let's start with the absolutely worst thing we can do with our cash, and that is leave it in a checking account. Now, I'm not talking about the cash we need to pay our monthly bills or even have a little extra cash on hand just in case we might need it at some point. That's logical. That we should continue to do either in a checking account or a savings account. I'm talking about keeping a decent amount of cash in a checking account, and we really have no reason for it to be there. This isn't a good move at all because unlike many years ago where the average checking account might pay a little bit of interest, today it pays virtually no interest. And believe it or not, this is a huge deal. Why, we might ask? Well, that's because of inflation. So roughly speaking, inflation is how much the price of an average good or a basket of goods goes up in a single year. So. This is a chart of inflation going back the past 20 years. And over this time period, well, the average inflation rate has been a bit over 2%. So that means that if we had $10,000 in cash, well, next year, we'd be able to buy about 2% less, taking the average inflation rate, we'd be able to buy about 2% less than we can today. So if we had our $10,000, we'd actually have to add 200 additional dollars, which is 2% of $10,000, 200 additional dollars to our account just to maintain the same buying power. Now, even if we wanted to go with the current most recent inflation rate number, well, that was 1.4%, well, we'd still have to add $140 at the end of the year just to maintain our current buying power with the $10,000 that we have. So either way, this is a bad thing because we're essentially just throwing that money out the window. So for the sake of this video, and just to keep the math simple, we're going to just use the 2% average inflation rate and pretend like that's the inflation rate we're going to get. Now, going back to our list here, well, after a checking account, the savings account, which is the most popular place for people, or at least Americans, to put their cash, well, the savings account, on average, brings in about one-tenth of 1%, one slightly less than that, on an annual basis. So that's still way off the 2% that we need to earn just to break even. So sticking with our same $10,000 in cash example, well, if we had that $10,000 in a savings account and a 2% inflation rate, well, instead of having to come up with $200 a year to maintain our buying power, well, thanks to our savings account, we'd have to now come up with $191 per year, which is better, sure, but not much better. And I'm sure we all understand that this is crazy tough given how low interest rates are today. So on one hand, Low interest rates makes buying houses or cars or even borrowing money in general much cheaper. But for those who have money saved, anybody who's sitting on cash, low interest rates are a killer. Now, even if we were to shift over to something like a certificate of deposit or CD for short, well, according to bankrate.com, they are claiming that the average one year CD pays just 41 basis points. So about four tenths of 1%. And with that CD, you have to lock up your money for one year. So we have to lock up our money for a year and we're gonna get less than a half of 1%. Once again, with inflation at 2%, assuming our $10,000, we still have to cough up $159 a year. We have to add to our account just to keep the same buying power. So CDs don't really cut it today either. Okay, moving right along. So next up, we have the high yield savings account. And I actually think this is one of the better choices on the list. There are no real great choices given how low, how extremely low interest rates are. So the first one that could be worth considering is Marcus by Goldman Sachs, and they pay 60 basis points. And that's, yes, the highest one we have so far. So that could be good for many people since it really offers the flexibility of uh, your typical savings account, but a much higher interest rate. Another good option is, and they have the same interest rate, is the American Express High Yield Savings Account. Once again, it offers the same interest rate and it offers the flexibility of a, a somewhat typical savings account. So that can be good. 
But sticking with our $10,000 in cash, well, we still have to throw away $140 a year just to keep the buying power. So although this is good, it's not great. Okay, now we're moving over to one that could make some sense for many people. Now, one option is to just invest in the stock market. But the issue there is that if we need this cash, let's say as an emergency fund, well, we have no real way of knowing what the return will be in stocks. So that can be very dangerous. COVID, as an example, COVID happens at the start of 2020. We have all our money in the stock market. Stock market crashes right around the same time we need that cash. So I'm not sure stocks for, a, for an emergency fund is a very smart move. With that being said, what could make much more sense is to consider putting our money into bonds. To illustrate just one potential choice, well, I found this Johnson & Johnson bond, and this one was issued with a uh, coupon rate of almost 6%. I actually think it was 5.95%. But that was back when the bond was issued, which was in 2007, and interest rates at that point were clearly much higher than they are today. And since interest rates have fallen, well, the price of the bond has gone way up. And that's an important relationship for us to remember. When interest rates fall, the price of the bonds go up. If interest rates go up, the price of the bond will go down. So instead of buying this bond back when it was first issued for, let's say, 100, well, now it's trading at about 155. So we're paying a much higher price, but we are getting a much higher coupon rate of almost 6%. So if we're curious, if we were to pay the current price for this particular bond, well, we would end up with, with what they call is a yield to maturity. And that yield to maturity for us would be about 2% at the current price which by coincidence is about the same inflation rate that we're looking at. So in theory, investing in this bond allows for us to maintain our buying power for however long we hold this bond. Now they call it a yield to maturity because it assumes that the price of the bond, which is at $150 right now, well, 156, I believe, 155, some, somewhere in that area. Well, the price will gradually drop down to the hundred where, where it will be when the bond matures but we're collecting much higher coupon payments every six months. So our overall yield ends up being about 2% based on today's price. And if we're curious, the maturity for this particular bond happens in 2037. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to hold this bond all the way until 2037. We could sell it if we wanted to. Let's say we had invested in this bond in the next year for some reason we need the cash, we can sell the bond. But the advantage of holding the bond until maturity is that you know what you're going to get at maturity. We don't know what the price of the bond is going to be in six months or a year or something along those lines. But if this cash is cash, we're just sitting there waiting for an opportunity or keeping just in case, investing in a bond could make sense. Now, I do want to point out that investing in a bond is not the same thing as investing in a bond ETF. ETF is short for exchange traded fund. Yes. Bond ETFs generally are less volatile than, let's say, a stock ETF. But because there is no maturity, well, that the price of that ETF is much more vulnerable to the whims of the market. So if we were to decide to invest in this bond and we were going to hold it till maturity, well, we know exactly what we're going to get. Of course, assuming Johnson & Johnson stays in business and continues to pay their bond. Well, assuming that's the case, we know what we're going to get. We know what we're going to get at the end. It's all pre-laid out for us unlike a uh, bond ETF. So I wouldn't, you, we could do a bond ETF if we were willing to deal with a bit more volatility than a standard bond, but don't make the mistake of assuming they're the same thing. And when we switch back to our list here, well, I recognize that there are very few good choices for what to do with cash during this time period. The real question in my mind is how long are they going to keep interest rates low? I personally think they're probably going to stay here for a while. If that's the case, then I'm not sure it makes a ton of sense to sit there just waiting, wait and hold cash and continue to let that cash lose value. Especially since just recently the Federal Reserve has come out and said they're willing to let the average inflation rate begin to go up a little. So if that, hap if that were to happen, well, that would make the need to be smart with our cash even more important. That being said, I know that there are many people who are not too familiar with bonds. Bonds are not uh, talked about as often as stocks are. And I actually did a video this year, earlier this year, where I run through the basics of investing in bonds. So if you're curious, perhaps that could be a good next video for you to watch. I got a link right here. I got a link in the description below. 
And thank you so much for sticking with me all the way to the end of the video. I really appreciate it. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next video.